My name is Paula Klein. I'm from Westtown Monthly Meeting, and I'm really happy to welcome you to the third of this four-part series that Ruth described to you. And our focus is on sharing resources related to healing our relationship with the natural world. And as a reminder, this grew out of the Concord Quarter Climate Action Working Group and a collaboration with the Eco Justice Collaborative as part of a larger climate ministry that is derived from a set of recommendations from, uh, from 2019, known as the Climate Sprint Report for Philadelphia Yearly Meeting. Um, for friends, we are suggesting that our community make 2023 the year that all of our institutions in Philadelphia Yearly Meeting commit to practices that support the commonwealth of life and practice ecological landscaping by applying for one of two certifications here that you can see on the screen and to register for the homegrown national parks registry. We hope that other faith communities will do the same. And today with red alerts for our air quality and 3 million, more than 3 million acres of forest lost in Alberta, Canada, we're reminded of the urgency of this action. So for those of you who might be starting, uh, joining us just for the first time, I just wanna review what we've done in the series and encourage you to look at the previous recordings but it's an orientation to both policy and these three certifications that will help guide us to protect and preserve the living things in our local habitat on our own properties. So we started with eco-friendly landscaping policies and why they matter with Doug Tallamy from the University of Delaware and a case study from Kendall Crosslands, as well as a presentation on the National Wildlife Feder Federation uh, green certification for houses of worship in March. In April, we looked at the Audubon Society's bird-friendly certification and actually the registration steps for the homegrown national parks and a real life example from Gwynedd Monthly Meeting. And this third session, as Ruth said, really focused on forests, the really inspiring carbon forest project with John Monroe. And then my husband and I, Alan and I, are gonna talk about our work in the cloud forest in Mexico. But this summer, we also hope that we'll, you'll attend a See for Yourself tour. Uh, the first will be held in, on June 17th in Chester County, Pennsylvania, with visits to Birmingham Monthly Meeting and two retirement communities, Barclay Friends and Kendall Crosslands in Kennett Township. The tours are free. Uh, we'll send you a flyer after this, this session, and we hope other faith communities will join us for those tours or that you'll create your own. There'll be more about this at the end of the program. So here's the flow for tonight's session. We're gonna start with an orientation to what are called private protected areas. And we are going to uh, think about that as the next step beyond what Doug Tallamy was suggesting in terms of converting our lawns to ecological landscapes. And then we're gonna look at two specific case studies, two potential solutions, one in the US and one in Mexico. We'll have a brain break between those two for people to stretch and get water. Uh, and then we'll uh, review closing steps and some specific actions you might wanna take tonight. So before we formally start the two presentations, I wanna refresh our memories from the very first session when we listened to Doug Tallamy's extremely compelling presentation called What's the Rush? which provided a context for why Americans need to take seriously the call to protect biodiversity where we live. He shared the 2016 book in which E.O. Wilson explained why if we want to save life on the planet, we need to protect functioning ecosystems. And if we want to protect functioning, functioning ecosystems, we need to set aside 50% of the earth for this purpose. Tallamy referred in specifically to the 2022 UN Biodiversity Conference, where countries reached a, a landmark agreement to try to reverse the destruction of nature. And one of the agreement's 23 targets, one of them was known as 30 by 30, which aims at at least 30% of the planet being protected by 2030. This is more modest than Wilson's goal. Um, so Doug Tellamy's answer uh, to on how to realize this 50% or even 30% by 2030 starts with the movement he described in which we transform our uh, 20 million of our lawns 
from sterile landscapes to biodiverse habitats. And that's an ambitious and urgent starting point, but not everyone will take up the challenge. And some of us will need to do more and commit to larger swaths of land for conservation. And this is what this is where privately protected areas come in or PPAs come in. Depending on the state or the country, they're known by different names, but PPAs invite property owners. And let's remember that we heard that 75% of all land in the US is owned privately. So whether individuals, families, organizations, faith groups or corporations, what they do is they enter into formal agreements to protect land for biodiversity and for the maintenance of the ecological services we all depend on. So we're gonna discuss two case studies tonight um, that depend on this type of conservation. So I wanna welcome my husband, Alan, who's gonna uh, speak uh, to you directly in a second to co-present with me regarding the first case study, but I wanna give you a little background first. We're members of Westtown Monthly Meeting I have a background in education. He has a background in uh, theology and philosophy. Earlier in our lives, we were anti-war activists and worked for the social justice revolution in Nicaragua in the 1980s and lived there through the 1990s as part of the New Haven Leon Sister City Project. And while we were in Nicaragua, although I don't think we understood what was happening, we began to see the early impacts of climate change and biodiversity losses firsthand. When we, uh, when we uh, began to do soil conservation in Nicaragua and regenerative agriculture, we brought that back with us when we returned to the US, which eventually led us in 1998 to join the faculty at Westtown School to initiate an equal literacy program. This involved school gardens for all grade levels and food production, which we used as teaching tools for sustainability. We recognized that the world our students would inherit would require a readiness to address climate change and uh, a spe a specifically natural resource scarcity. So how did we end up uh, doing uh, reforestation work in Mexico? We first heard about the amazing work being done by a young couple named Tanya and Ricardo Romero, who lived in Veracruz. And we went to see these innovators who were radically changing their lifestyle to reflect what they understood about climate change and threats to biodiversity. What we saw in them was the Quaker impulse to align ourselves with the truth. What would it look like? What would it look like if we took seriously what we know about our bro broken relationship with the natural world? What actions would we take to be in right relation with the commonwealth of life? So I'm gonna turn it over to Alan for him to share some of the ways we thought about that. You're gonna advance my slides. Yep. Now it hardly merits repeating what we all so painfully recognize. Our planet's once stable climate is becoming unstable. If that were not bad enough, consider a few so sobering statistics. The earth's fresh water supplies are running short. Currently 1.1 billion people in the planet lack access to water, while 2.7 billion find water scarce for at least one month of the year. Experts predict that by 2030, global freshwater demand will exceed supply by 40%. <clears throat> Over the past 150 years, more than half of the planet's fertile topsoil has disappeared. 95% of our food crops depend upon this topsoil to produce a harvest. And the air we breathe? Over 40% of the world's oxygen is produced from rainforests. Between 1990 and 2020, over 80 million hectares of old growth forests were cleared. More than 80% of the Earth's old growth forests have been burned or cut down. <clears throat> so what has led to this critical situation in a relatively short time frame? Author Daniel Quinn in his novel, Ishmael, claims that in the Earth's 4.5 billion year history, there've only been two human cultures. The original human culture, Quinn calls levers. Levers cover the, have covered the whole of the past 300,000 years. And levers are still among us, but their numbers are dwindling. Levers live in harmony with and within the limits of nature. They see nature as a place of abundance for which they express gratitude. The second culture 
Quinn calls takers. These include all of the civilizations which have emerged over the past 10,000 years. Takers have attempted to dominate and control nature. These are civilizations characterized by, econ by economies of extraction and exploitation and are often driven by a profit motive. They see the world through eyes of scarcity. It appears that the dramatic shift in consciousness from lever consciousness to taker consciousness is driving the global problems facing us. According to Quinn, we are captive to a civilization that quote, more or less compels one to go on destroying the world in order to live. Albert Einstein famously observed that quote, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. If one level of consciousness has created humanity's worsening existential problems, then what level of consciousness would be required to solve these problems? We're here to talk tonight about the, a new approach to conservation, a third emergent culture, if you will. Let's call them givers. These are humans who promote an abundant scenario, who participate in the natural world as a keystone species. This third giver culture, in Ptolemy's words, quote, gives up the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist. This new consciousness recognizes its critical role in shepherding the health and well being of all life on this planet. Doug Talamy describes it as changing our culture from an adversarial approach to nature to a collaborative one. Eco villages, regenerative agriculture, B corporations, renewable energy, and ecosystem restoration, these are all signs that a third culture is emerging. While there's no guarantee that such a culture will take hold or take over, it seems evident that the taker model of resource extraction, waste, and unlimited growth on a finite planet is doomed to collapse sooner or later. With this process in mind, 20 years ago, Paul and I began an experiment. What would it look like to be a giver, to collaborate, repair, and restore our relationship with nature by restoring a parcel of cloud forest in the state of Veracruz, Mexico. As I mentioned, we began our journey to conservation by meeting the Romeros at their project called Las Canales in 2003. They lived on a 600 acre cattle ranch with no electricity or running water. They realized early on that they owned a fragment of the original cloud forest and understanding the fragility of that ecosystem, they sold their cattle and replaced them with a smaller dairy herd. They had set their sights on creating a model for a simple lifestyle that was sustainable and compatible with protecting their local habitat. For us, they embodied this new approach to conservation. For those of you who haven't been, the cloud forest can be captured by simple statistics. 75% of the world's fresh water comes from forested watersheds. And among these forest systems, cloud forests provide additional hydrological benefits. Because of their location and their characteristics, they improve water availability, they regulate surface and groundwater flow, and maintain high water quality. The, the cloud forest is important not only for water, but because it also presents high species richness, especially epiphytes and insects, and they're considered a priority hotspot for biodiversity, uh, excuse me, conservation. But there's more. They're essential for migratory birds. They help prevent flooding. They capture carbon, they mediate temperatures, and this doesn't even begin to express the majesty, the awe, the peace, and the beauty to be found there. But in the state of Veracruz, the cloud forest area decre decreased to almost half their original surface between 1973 and 2003 due to land change coverages. That's people cutting the forest down. In our area of Huatusco, you can see in these charts that the area has actually been hemorrhaging cloud forest habitat in the last decade. In 2004, through a series of very unexpected circumstances, Ricardo informed us that his neighbor wanted to sell 100 hectares or 250 acres, and he was hoping that we might step in as the new owners to prevent a buyer who might remove the remaining trees and turn the property into a chicken ranch or an avocado plantation. And we, we felt led, we looked hard at each other, but we felt led to take this next step, not really knowing what we were getting into. 
We named the project Las Peotas, or the acorns, after the endangered oaks on the property and for the symbolism of the new life represented by acorns. And this is pretty much what the property looked like after so many decades of cattle grazing. Our first step was to get guidance since neither of us are biologists. We turned to the National Institute of Ecology in Jalapa, a nearby city, and their faculty gave us a framework for this work and lots of concrete handholding. We started just with the concept of restoration ecology, which is defined as a process of assisting in the recuperation of an ecosystem that's been degraded, damaged, or destroyed, and we had plenty of that. Restoration ecology requires a reference ecosystem so that you know uh, what, would a, what would a cloud forest actually look like. And it includes passive and active strategies. So in the first phase, which was active restoration, we, uh, through a series of grants and our own work, we decided to try to to install on site as many trees as possible. So in the first year, we planted 10,000 trees representing 27 varieties. The following year, we did a little over 10,000 trees, but with fewer varieties. And then the last year of sort of this big push, we did more than 17,000, but we included shrubs as well as trees and 30 varieties. And we did this because what we learned from the biologists is that tropical forests are not just made up of trees, which others might have known, but was news to us, and that the herb and uh, sub canopy level was really important. I have pictures here of what made this a challenge. Um, in, in a period of you know five years or so, we planted about 40,000 trees, but not all of them survived. If you've seen the movie, which you should see, The Biggest Little Farm, you have a reference point for our experience. Our poor little saplings faced all sorts of dangers out in the world. Tusas and mice eating their roots, ants decimating their foliage, climate disruption leading to totally unheard of killing frost and hail storms, and of course the losing battle to outcompete exotic grasses and bracken enough to get sunshine. Um, in short, for some years and in yeah, for some trees and in some years, we faced high losses. A specific example is Dr. Lopez, who's in this uh, uh, photo. She tracked uh, more than a thousand of the endangered variety of oaks known as chicalaba. And after four years, she found a high mortality rate due to tusas. But we also had a parallel process of passive restoration. We selected large areas that we would just let nature take its course. And in some of these areas, the bracken took over, but in others which were close enough to our neighbors and our remaining intact fragments, we saw dramatic resilience. This is a photo of our neighbor's land, which shows that what can reemerge as a secondary force in less than 10 years. We've had the same results, which has astounded even the biologists. So here's an aerial photo from 2003 on the left, and on the right is the photo of after almost 20 years. We feel incredibly gratified that we feel that we've met our first goal, which was to stop doing harm and to begin healing our relationship with nature by assisting in the recuperation of an ecosystem. There are many ways you can measure this recuperation. Tree covers one. Numbers of plants at each level is another, but also who's come home. Our biologist colleagues continue to measure our progress, and they've seen an increase in birds, reptiles, amphibians, and most recently using these night cameras, uh, mammals, including jaguarundis, which is a small cat, and foxes. I'm going to turn it back to Alan to, to tell the next part of the story. Sure. Thanks, Paula. Amanda Crandall, who was a doctoral student working with Doug Tallamy, observed something that at first is not immediately obvious. She said, as you see on the screen, while conservationists claim to be managing species and habitats, what we are actually managing is people. This brings us back to Einstein's insight. We will never solve major problems 
from the same level of consciousness that caused them. The problem of the destruction of the Earth's ecological fabric will not be solved without altering our current level of consciousness. We must shift to a consciousness that cares for natural processes so that all living things, not just humans, can flourish now and in the future. No matter how many trees we replant, without shifting our consciousness, future generations could come along, see forest habitats as nothing more than raw material and cut them down. We must cultivate in ourselves and others a vision of interdependence accompanied by an ethic of respect for all life. So we began this journey of consciousness shifting by bringing Quaker youth leadership delegations to Mexico. We taught teens nonviolent communication while introducing sustainable living skills and inviting them to become part of the regeneration process by planting trees and growing and harvesting food sustainably. Then, Six years ago, we inaugurated the second phase of our project. We built this, the Center for Spiritual Ecology. People of all ages come to the center, not only to plant trees, but also in a very real sense, to reforest their minds and their hearts, to restore their inner ecosystem. People come to experience the world through new eyes, employing ancient practices of meditative mindfulness and yoga. <clears throat> At the same time, we utilize contemporary approaches to grieving losses and seeing the world anew. At the center, people come together in ritual song, dance, and spiritual practice to weave together new ways of being on the earth with one another in cooperation with natural processes. Robin Wall Kimmerer, in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, describes the ways humans can impact nature by assuming a posture of reverence and gratitude. Rather than shrinking from our ecological footprint, we have learned from native peoples to respectfully expand our footprint through selection, cultivation, and selective harvest of nature, all the while acknowledging our interconnectedness, humility, and appreciation. We are modeling how to become a keystone species rather than a parasitic one. In the case of the center, we built all of our structures using natural materials borrowed from the 250 acres, using wood and earth and bamboo. In every case, we left the site with more trees and bamboo than preceded the construction. We've made a commitment to go beyond conservation. Our goal is to restore a harmonious relationship with the natural world through our day-to-day -day choices. Every day we capture and filter rainwater, then we hand pump it from a cistern for cooking and washing dishes. We solar heat our sh shower water. We value slow food in ways that we grow, prepare, and enjoy our meals. We design our plant-based menus around whatever is in season, grown organically, and produced locally, honoring Mexican cultural food ways. <laughs> we cook with wood or with sun. <clears throat> and heat shower water with excess energy released from the chimney. More than carbon neutral, we are net positive. Our facilities are 100% off-grid and we capture more carbon than we release through reforestation. Our toilets are all waterless composting style. Every day, we turn our waste into fertility rather than pollution. Our gray water gets filtered by aquatic plants before returning perfectly clean back to the local watershed. Water is borrowed, not consumed, while the process produces fragrant carbon-rich lilies. Nearly 40 year years ago, Kirkpatrick Sale popularized the concept of bioregionalism. Responding to the global, growing global ecological crisis, his book, Dwellers in the Land, offered an alternative to neoliberal globalization. By describing a smaller scale alternative social organization based on local watersheds, Sale inspired us to seek and contribute to a more ecological sound, ecologically sound way of living. He called this new organization structure the Ecostery, a small community of individuals and families living and working together to learn about and restore important sacred and fruitful portions of the earth to their fullest complexity and productivity. We challenged ourselves to live within and to learn from the natural limits imposed by our cloud forest ecosystem. We set, 
we set out to undertake three essential tasks Sale identified. First, we gathered scholarship and oral wisdom that taught us the characteristics of the species and habitats of our local area, from microbiome to bioregion. We consulted with elders, indigenous community plant markets, as well as with biologists and ethnobotanists to learn local foodways and traditional forest friendly planting systems. Next, second, we inaugurated projects of rehabilitation, chiefly by ecological restoration, returning designated areas to their natural, largely wild state as a supplement to the reforestation on our land. We have become an anchor for our watershed as a tree nursery. We have pledged to produce 7,000 native hardwood saplings a year for free distribution. We offer trainings in planting and care. We support home and school-based nurseries. We organize planting events at schools and municipal properties. We're joining together with neighbors to create a thousand acre privately protected ecological preserve. And third, we're developing human communities, small scale and eco-centered that will carry out these tasks. Each group that visits plants trees for the next generation, building a relationship with the forest ecosystems and making a commitment to the future, healing both ecological and personal emerges out of proximity to nature. <clears throat> We will continue in the coming years to connect across generations by focusing on young children, their teachers, and their families. In the common cause of an abundant future, we will work together to become givers and contributors rather than takers and destroyers. We all have a unique role in the healing of the earth. So we're really happy to make an announcement tonight. Um, we were we were in Mexico uh, two weeks ago, and the very last week we were there, we were visited by the State Department of the Environment, and we were just awarded the designation of an ecological reserve by the state of Veracruz. And this is an extraordinary way for us to celebrate our 20th anniversary. And I want to close this by saying, if we're not biologists. Um, we can make it work. Anyone can make it work. Others can do this too. So I hope you will look for opportunities within your own family, your faith community, and any other organizations you're connected with to both transform your own lawn, the way Doug Talamy, Allah Doug Talamy, and look for opportunities to protect larger parcels. I'm including in the slide deck the references for both a US-based and an international guidebook on how to create a privately protected area, which provides a lot of great guidance. So we're going to transition now from the amateurs to the uh, professionals, because John is a professional ecologist. So I'm gonna take a minute, actually, maybe I'll go back to this, and I think we have time to see if there are any questions and comments. Yeah, we have at least five minutes or more if we have any questions and comments from the audience before we turn it over to John. Paula, that's this is just so incredible what you have all um, created there in the cloud forest. Um, oh my gosh, I'm just so amazed and impressed. And thank you so much for doing that. Um, is, so I guess my uh, question is, is this um, a community where people actually live or is it kind of people come in and they stay while they happen to be doing work and people come in sort of shifts and stay for a while and help and volunteer and then leave and other people come in? Is it that sort of thing? That's a great question, and I think it's an appropriate question to ask for any big project of this scale. And I would say that what we didn't share in our story is that we are very much part of a larger neighborhood of people who are committed to this work. Las Cañadas is an active, vibrant cooperative where people live and work. And within our neighborhood, we must have maybe 13 families that are all dedicated in some capacity to this level of protection of the cloud forest and both Las Cañadas and Las Piotas, we receive short-term visits for people who come for trainings or retreats 
or one day visits from local people from schools, as we mentioned. And then there both programs have long term apprenticeships and volunteer programs. So both both are true. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Is there a website uh, connected to your work? Um, we have a Facebook page and our on our community or sorry, our eco village does have, I think, a Facebook mm -hmm. page um, in Spanish. It's all, that's all in Spanish. But yes, I can I can put that in the resources I send out. Um, yeah, I mean, you you all have done such amazing work. It would be wonderful um, to learn more about it and understand it better. Um, and so could you describe a little bit more the human community around you? Would you like to take a turn? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Las Cañadas was the magnet for everyone because they're, they were just so far ahead of the curve in terms of understanding sustainability. So what's happened over the last 20 years since we met them is that uh, people, families and mature adults have chosen to come and throw their lot in with that community. They're almost all Mexicans, but there are a few international couples that are there as well. They have already uh, graduated one generation of children in this community, and there are now younger, newer families there who have kids under five. Mm. I, I would say most of them in the initial uh, wave of people needed to find work outside of the community initially to make it possible to have a, a sufficient income to manage living in the in this setting. But as things have evolved, the co-op has grown and many people are now co-op members and more people are finding ways to actually um, earn their living by doing watershed work or other kinds of work that aligns with the goals of the community as a whole. Yeah, I just have to say this is beginning, it's reminding me a tiny bit of Costa Rica's transition from, you know, near deforestation in the early 70s, uh, when the governor, the government realized that, you know, they were on the path to self-destruction and that reforestation was absolutely critical to restoring the economy of the country. And they, you know, began to conduct a, a massive reforestation project which is has led to you know i don't know statistically but a really really high level of ecologically um you know environmentally trained people are really um so many people there are so many naturalists and uh, people who are you know really expert at understanding their land so do you see the beginnings of that for Mexico in the work that you're doing? I, I have to say I don't actually. Um, I, I, one of the tragic experiences of COVID was we weren't able to visit or, or be active for two years. And when we returned, there was such a dram visibly dramatic loss of, of cloud forest habitat mm. on, on the road between where we live and the local town. Mm. And and while I think the uh, there are they have the equivalent of the EPA, et cetera, I think those people are all committed, and there are several NGOs that are committed. But right now, the tide is not yet turned, and in fact, I, I think we're really facing an uphill battle to protect the fragments that are left. That said, we as a couple were very much inspired by specifically the cloud forest in Monteverde and the and the Quakers just post World War II, and that area has been a, a real model and uh, we're hopeful that that we can do something similar we're we are spreading our example up the watershed up to Elotepec and uh, there are there are towns that are we have some hope well I'm and I might add to that we have urgency I didn't share I, well I said how important the cloud forest habitat is for water and when we first moved there and the discussion was about climate change, everyone laughed, oh, well, we'll never run out of water. Well, mm. yes, 2023, the three or four communities that surround us, the villages that surround us, they don't have water every day. Mm. The rivers are down. And even when it's been the, the rains came a month early this year, 
and mm -hmm. they did not increase the flow in the river. Mm -hmm. So, so I think urgency is is pushing those communities to install composting toilets rather than more drainage. That they're looking at the high efficiency fuel stoves. That they're looking at ways in which they can, you know, reduce their their dependence on uh, fossil fuels as well to limit the pollution in their area. So I actually think the, the natural pressures, just like when I look out my window, I, I could be in the cloud forest right now because of the smoke from Canada. That some, of, some of the reality of of what we can't, can't kind of roll back easily will, I think, perhaps inspire people to be more cautious about far, cloud forest loss. Mm -hmm. We can probably at most take one more comment and then I want to give everybody a chance to stretch and turn it over to John. Well, I'm noticing that Ruth has um, her hand up. Should I just barge in with my question? Um, this is so inspiring and it occurs to me that there are people who would probably want to get involved either by being part of a, a retreat at your center or finding some other way to support this work. And I wonder how they would go about letting you know that. Um, thank you. Well, we will send information about both projects out to everyone who registered for the webinar. We are holding right now a GoFundMe campaign to, to do some work to uh, work on our, our nurseries and to finish a kitchen that we're trying to put together so we can host more people. And we, we would love to offer either delegations or working groups or retreats. So anyone who's interested, we do do that. Um, we do it with adults and young people and we would be happy to help organize or cooperate or coordinate with other people who are interested. So I'll be happy Can to Can you put that. the link to the GoFundMe uh, campaign in the chat too? Sure, I'd be happy to, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna suggest that we do what um, I learned is often called a um, brain break. <clears throat> and say that everybody should stand up, stretch, turn their bodies, because I want your all both hemispheres of your brain fully operating to hear the next presentation, which is awesome. And John's going to put his up, and I'll see you in a minute. Woohoo! All right. Well, it is a real honor to be in introducing John uh, Monroe, who uh, told me about this project a year ago. It's absolutely brilliant, and I really look forward to his presentation and all of us considering where could we do what he's suggesting we do. So John, welcome. Climate change, things that must be done. Um, this is setting for what I'm gonna talk about. Modeling shows that we can't plant enough for us to do all of the climate change reversal that's needed. Pumping carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere will have to be done on a massive scale. Conversions to the use of electric energy produced as locally as possible and using renewable sources need to happen. Cutting down of at least 90% of fossil fuel burning will have to be done probably with the government regulatory force. Agricultural land should be dedicated primarily to producing food and sequestering carbon, not producing energy. Planting of hardwood forests in our region is entirely appropriate action, but must be accompanied by many other large actions. Okay, planting trees. Okay, we're not, not in semi-tropical and tropical Mexico here. We're in <clears throat> Northeast US, so all different. Planting trees, plant trees that are native to Pennsylvania. Plant hardwood trees for best carbon density. If planting many trees, plant various native species for diversity. Do not over fertilize them. Do not plant non-natives or bargain trees. Protect them from deer brows or rubbing. Take care of them while they're growing. This could be a while. They are your carbon legacy. Put them where they won't have to be cut down in the future. 
This gets us to the Carbon Forest Project. ENME Friends Meeting sort of gave us the kick in the butt to move on this and became, it became an official project. Uh, so this is now the project. If you're gonna plant a whole forest, planting trees for forests are arguably the most effective ways to produce solar energy collectors since the tree leaves absorb sunlight energy, cool the air through evaporation, provide the energy to power photosynthesis, and through photosynthesis, convert carbon dioxide to solid carbon compounds and free oxygen. We're gonna plant our first, our first 10 acre forest that could eventually contain 190 tons of carbon per acre or much more. Where do you start? <clears throat> Figure out what's the reference condition or model? Where are places that can show you what the old original forest looked like? Inventory and document the existing planting site so you know the site, all the dynamics that you're gonna have to deal with when you plant. Plan infrastructure and structural details. Develop a basic planting plan and then the detailed patch pages. <clears throat> Specify all planting stock and materials. Then oversee the entire sequential planting process. Check for completeness and assess project completion. Open to limited public access. Begin maintenance monitoring. This equals adaptive management. You don't just see what's going on, you correct the problems as you go. <clears throat> These are views of our original Pennsylvania forest 400 million years ago. There were no trees, there was no woody plant material in it. It's all herbaceous. These were horsetails, ferns, and club mosses that persisted for millions of years and built up all that carbon anaerobically in the swamp forest that exists then. They all make up our present day coal. After the glaciers receded, gradually hardwood forests came to dominate this region. They were quite wide diversity. In this map, you'll see some of the <clears throat> forest types of this region. The darker green is where we exist and those forest types concluded a number of different uh, mixes. All of these mixes here were present within this region, other than number 105 mangrove forest, which was, which is only in Florida, in our, on our continent, or in our country, but lots of different mixes. Okay, you find a place you're gonna work, a potential site, it may have existing forests on its boundaries. It could have a farm, agricultural land, residential properties um, all surrounding it. You need to understand what this site is. I hope to have a lawn or a cornfield and with no competing exotic vegetation, but we'll see what we get. Once you have this site, you have to lay out what forest types are you going to plant on it mixed hardwood forest on the music or moderately moist land, dry oak forest on the drier areas, or possibly where sandy soil may exist, riparian or swamp forest where there is a stream corridor. Around the perimeter, <clears throat> edges are noted here because you have to develop sort of sealing and uh, edges between your newly planted forest and what is new neighboring uh, condition. Different for roads versus forest. You gotta do logistics and infra infrastructure work, meaning <clears throat> if you're gonna plant any kind of native forest in this area, you've gotta protect from deer because they'll come in and gobble it up within a week. Deer fence, with solid corners, with exit gates for both chasing deer out if you ever get them, and 
um, gates where potential uh, trails will be connected for pedestrian access, as well as a functional gate that allows for larger vehicles to come in during the planting and preparation work. Lay out all of the different types in patches. These are maybe a quarter acre, or a little bit larger, it can be variable size, but each pa patch will have a page, a text page describing in the entire content of what's gonna go in that patch. <clears throat> this system works very well when laying out a large site. Anyway, you see all the patches here for this theoretical site and the various categories of forest and edge that are gonna be used here. This is all based on both reference literature as well as collection of information on reference plots in various forest forests in this Eastern forest region. Here's some grad students collecting some of the data. Some of the data is collected in reference plot data sets as shown here, several different ones, lots of data, spacing, location, size, are there any uh, patterns of shrubs or herbs on the site? Do they adapt to certain conditions? Um, what are their heights and their diameters, et cetera, et cetera? There's a whole lot of these reference uh, collection, data collection sets that we have to work with. Some of these include pretty well drawn 3D views or, or uh, views from oblique angles showing what the, this, this forest actually looked like. This is for a 100 by 100 reference plot in Pennsylvania. We also have to look at the forest as a true ecological forest. This one's showing all the various components. They're not listed here, but you can see their stratification. Starting down in the soil level that we're burrowing box and other rodent dens, coming up to the uh, organic matrix level, the decaying leaves and the various levels of decomposition that uh, lies under them. The <clears throat> fact that, that that layer has the largest number of species present in the entire uh, forest ecosystem. <clears throat> including microinvertebrates, macroinvertebrates, insects, and uh, primarily mycorrhizae of, of fungal species. Above that, you have ground using uh, vertebrates and birds. And above that, you have the forest itself with birds and burrowing um, animals that use even the higher parts of the uh, forest, including insects up there. Lots of components. This Turk's cap lily is one of, could be 50 different species of wildflower that might be planted in a carbon forest. This is one of maybe 50 different vines or shrubs that might be planted. This is the native bittersweet, not the exotic invasive one that you're gonna see all over this region. You won't find any of these if you look for them because look, I found only two of them in Pennsylvania in my entire career. We'll be planting some of Native American chestnuts, even though there's still a blight out there, but we found some sources for blight-free uh, planting stock, which we'll be using. All kinds of shrubs, including this uh, maple leaf viburnum will be included. <clears throat> this uh, trailing arbutus, a wildflower and ground cover is also the sort of thing we'll be planting. Okay, what will we be planting? We'll be planting a native mixed hardwood set of species based on scientific vegetation literature, which we have considerable amount here. We'll be planting a wide diversity of Pennsylvania native trees, probably on the order of 20 to 30 species per acre. <clears throat> species specifications compensating for the loss of 
things like the American chestnut, ash species, and the dwindling number of even uh, oaks and hickories. We're gonna to have to compensate to produce a mix of trees which produce a lot of mast species, nut producing species. We're gonna be using container grown one year stock, not bare root or seedling stock. We're gonna be using, and that's basically for maximum survival. We're gonna be adding organic material, wood chips, composted wood chips as needed before planting for both carbon <clears throat> sequestration and for fungal hyphae growth. Hyphae are roots of fungi. Inoculant plugs from existing forests will be also be used in order to bring back some of the micro and macro invertebrate species in the forest floor. We'll be adding shrub and herb content as needed per site project, and that'll be quite variable, I expect. We'll be using hardwood species. Oh, shown on the right is a red oak tree, which is very densely spaced yearly growth rings, annual growth rings. On the left is a softwood showing how widely spaced the uh, typical growth ring rings are on softwood species. The close space indicate the density of carbon being sequestered in the wood. An example patch page, this for a 0.95 acre large patch uh, on a project shows both the, all the species that are gonna be used, the number of trees being used per species, <clears throat> the shrub species and the numbers there, as well as herbs and other content, as well as look, wood chips thrive 358 cubic yards on this acre, malt straw, and you're only seeing part of the page here. This is about the smallest stock we'd be using. These are Osage orange trees grown for about a year in, in pots, deep pots, which are appropriate for deep rooting species that grow fast downward. We're gonna be planting tulip poplar, black oak, chestnut oak, white oak, pignut hickory, black cherry, sugar maple, shagbark hickory, hackberry, ironwood, basswood, redbud, persimmon, and sycamore. The forest type or system being restored are we are planting a native hardwood forest. We're planting spa spacing and placement as random, not straight lines or grids at about a 10 foot spacing for trees. We're not planting a plantation for cutting nor for harvest. We are not planting an orchard of fruit trees or nut trees for commercial use. This is a grid planted forest from about 30 years ago. We're not doing this. Planted forests do not grow in rows. We're planting forests that'll grow rapidly <clears throat> as the environment will handle and the trees will grow vertically to the point where the canopy will eventually uh, merge to pre prevent sunlight from getting to the forest floor and the lower branches of these trees will start to self prune because they don't get sunlight anymore. And they look like tall, skinny top trees. This young reference forest of silver and red maple in New Jersey shows sort of an early density of a seed, seed produced forest, but it shows also the content of a, a, a simp, uh, forest with wet feet. <clears throat> this is a even more wet. This, these trees include ash, hackberry, black gum, and various other maple species. And it's a great habitat for spring peepers and wood frogs. This is a drier conditioned forest. This, this is primarily a chestnut oak forest with some pin oak and a few other oak, uh, oak and other species present. But you'll notice that the ground level is primarily what you call ericaceous species. What <clears throat> blueberries, 
and huckleberries, a lot of low bush blueberry here. Number of herbs and wildflowers are particular to this kind of a region. This, a Piedmont, relatively flat forest, hardwood forest, but it has a mix of <clears throat> more maples, what, some tulips and oaks, as well as uh, <clears throat> lots of herbs and uh, shrub patches spaced out here and there with, with large visibility. Visibility is easy through these areas. In this case, there's a fern cover on the ground. Now, foresters hate them because they say uh, oak trees can't grow up through them. They've never approved it, but it's why they spray all these areas with herbicide when they want a forest to grow. Here, an oak hickory forest in Montgomery County as a reference system. Again, this has a fair amount of organic material on the forest floor. We like that. It's going to support the organic matrix. This mixed deciduous forest in Montgomery County as well has a number of young beech trees that are popping up in the shrub layer now. They'll grow taller. This is also a relatively mature forest. Now realize ecologists rate maturity both when it reaches a canopy level and as it grows continually on into uh, old growth condition. Foresters consider maturity the minute the tree gets to the size you can cut it down. Difference of opinion, okay. Um, this older growth forest here is in Montgomery County, but has lower branches only on the side of this forest where it is open on a parking lot. Here is an example of a, a maritime forest, which gives a good model for an edge condition, which I'd like to have along open edges of our planted carbon forest. This is caused by wind and salt shear with the Atlantic Ocean out there, but it gives us a reference for what should an edge actually look like on a forest. We turn that into a, a model for how you build a forest edge strip along the outer perimeter of these forests. It's to basically make wind go up the slope and over the top of the forest rather than hitting the, the tall trees growing face on and bringing in exotic species and knocking trees down. How we know about the rate at which trees grow is with lots of data collection and sampling of deep diameters of breast height and sampling of core tree cores. We know how fast trees can grow and we can project how fast they will grow to reach a canopy closure condition, which is shown here on the right. And it, in our situation, it'll probably take 20 to 30 years for canopy closure to occur. In our region, some areas you can have trees fall down, start to rot, and if it's moist enough, you can get a nurse log condition to occur. Here, a tree fell down probably on the order of 30 years ago, and now you have new tree seedlings growing on this nurse log. Here's another one, which is hemlock, also in, in Pennsylvania, in a wetter situation, but this, you can see the straight line of the nurse log, which log, which fell and started to rot, oh, probably 40 years ago, now has new growth of hemlock right on top of that old nurse log. In dry areas, logs will fall down to the forest floor and gradually rot, but there's not enough humidity in our temperate forest to produce much in the way of a nurse log condition. Next important point, the organic matrix of the forest floor. <clears throat> Foresters like to call this the duff or litter, sort of deprecative terms of for all these leaves that lay around that they don't care about. <clears throat> the ecologists can look at this from a different standpoint, the living sponge at the forest floor. This is where no, the most species diversity in the entire forest exists. Micro, macro invertebrates, all kinds of species. The primary thing is that this is the layer where the 
fungal hyphae move information and nutrients both from forest floor, from woody plant to woody plant, and up to the larger trees. We're using the term organic matrix for this layer. Here is an organic layer, organic matrix layer under a mixed hardwood and white pine uh, forest. If you cut into this and take a plug out, it's going to look like this. This is about, this one is about two and a half inch to three inch thick plug over organic matrix over top of the mineral soil. Even the mineral soil is sort of dark here because some carbon is still in that section of the plug that was <clears throat> not taken out. This layer has a huge amount of uh, uh, life in it, diverse life, and is essential to a true forest existence. The fungi that might be on the surface that produce the, the hyphae or fungal roots that go throughout this organic matrix are things like coral fungi, fungus, infinite number of mushrooms, <clears throat> and varieties of fungi. We're gonna to have to deal with the competition and site problems. They include a list of exotic and invasive earthworm species, exotic and invasive tree, shrub, vine, herbs, and grasses, the problem of increased storm damage from microbursts, hail, or possible tornadoes, excessive deer populations, <clears throat> uniform almost throughout entire Pennsylvania area, way overpopulated. We have to protect our new plantings from deer browsing. All these items can add cost and extra work for carbon forest projects. <clears throat> Excuse me. This hillside landscape in Evansburg State Park is shown during the growing season. But guess what? All of the leaves from last fall have been eaten up by exotic earthworms. All of the uh, ferns and wildflowers can't exist here anymore because the slope has become too dry. Why? Here's a couple of my grad students who are out. We hand rake some leaves away from the forest floor at this location where exotic earthworms are quite present. Look at the land in front of them. Now look closer. Uh, they didn't bring these earthworms in. This is how many were there eating up all those leaves. And they leave the leave the earth, <coughs> the forest, <coughs> excuse me, the forest floor uh, surface barren over winter because. Their castings, which is worm poop, will be washed down the slope into the creek by spring. Exotic invasive species, kudzu. You've probably heard of it. I'm not sure if any of you have seen it, but in the south, kudzu can cover acres of land uh, with only a few <clears throat> source plants. It'll cover trees. It'll kill the trees. It'll allow the trees to rot and fall over, it will become the only surface of the ground over time. It is moving north with climate change. <laughs> Asiatic bittersweet climbs to the top of trees, can shade them out and kill them. <clears throat> Porcelain berry, another invasive exotic vine, can also climb to the top of trees and kill them and cover everything. We have these commonly in the Delaware Valley. Here is a landscape on a university campus. Other than those two uh, probably uh, black locust trees there, I think everything else in this photograph is e an exotic invasive plant. If you have such a landscape, it takes machines of this sort Note the steel blades on the bottom of this machine. They're an inch thick and they're blunt things and it, it just beats the woody landscape down to nothing. Starting with you know four inch trees, you can cut them down to <clears throat> chips with this machine, which is a, a hydro wax. You can't be anywhere near this machine when it's being used. But this is the kind of thing it takes to at the first round of getting rid of it, a woody exotic species mix to prepare it for something else, some other kind of planting work, native 
planting work. And it'll take another couple of years worth of herbicide work to get rid of this stuff. We don't want to have to touch this, okay? We also have um, microbursts that produce wind in a straight direction here. This one in Upper Salford Township, my home township. In recent years, it blew down a whole lot of trees. And uh, we want to prevent this with good dense tree planting and good edge work. <clears throat> deer fencing. This is out in the open, but our deer fencing will probably be in the middle of our edge patches. Here showing a vernal pool, which would be re really nice to have in woodland patches in our areas. Um, it's a good place for um, various species of, of amphibians. It doesn't show very much, even if it's out, out in the open, but if it's in an edge patch, it'll practically be invisible, but it's a critical piece to protect new plantings. What is mature forest growth? We're looking straight up into the canopy of uh, deciduous forests in our region. This one is probably on the order of 80% closure of the canopy. This one, a little bit more, but when you get complete shading up there, it produces a cooler, moister understory area, which is essential to our <clears throat> organic matrix on the forest floor. Here you're looking at a up through the middle of a four trunk tulip tree toward the canopy. Okay, what is all growth, our long-term target for these carbon forests? <clears throat> it becomes old growth because it's gonna be protected by deed restrictions, conservation easements from cutting. Old growth is ancient forest, never cut, never harvested, harvested, never logged, has little disturbance in its past. <clears throat> it's similar to the pre-colonial ecological condition. And it has a historic high level of species diversity. These photos in Jacobsburg, Northampton County, is the nearest old growth to, the, to my location here. It's a small patch, it's mostly in a ravine area, but it does have some really old oak trees. And it looks like this. Here mixed with a few hemlocks. Tall, straight trees with a Canopy that spreads out at the point of them, maybe on the order of 60 or 80 feet. <clears throat> old growth also comes this way. This is West Coast old growth. This one is Citrus spruce, 270 feet tall, 500 years old. This is West Coast Olympic National Forest rainforest conditions. They're different than here, but this is to get give you an idea of what old growth can actually look like. Here's a nurse log that's probably been down 80 years with an entire cover of new seedlings of evergreen trees. Again, West Coast. This is a nurse log that probably went down, well, who knows, 150 years ago with trees large size trees over three foot diameter already growing on top of the nurse log. Here are several views of Western old growth. This is, this is evergreen forest, rain forest, Northwest. If you've ever seen a sacred space, this is one. <laughs> These are sacred spaces. You know it when you walk into one. A few more views. What's the project that, how is this project different and unique? Carbon forest is being done specifically to remove and sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere locally, to be done by local groups with donated funding. It's probably the only regional project to plant native hardwood forests. It's designed to produce permanent forest cover, eventual old growth condition. It's designed to be scalable 
the, cl the plan can be replicated on much larger sites, times 10, times 100, much larger, many other sites. It's designed as an ecological restoration project. That's my, <laughs> that's my background. Very few, if any other projects or be forest projects are being done like this. It's based on existing ecological methods, technology, skills, materials, and project experience. Unlike most tree planting work being done anywhere. These are the carbon forest project needs, Monet monetary donations, help in getting major grant funding, doing out doing the application work. We're looking for organizations that will endorse and or support the project. This will include <clears throat> land conservation organizations. We'll need feedback on the project from interested individuals, including you. This is our contract contact information right there on the e available through email. We have a two-page brochure and a 23-page primer on the project much more detail available. Thank you. And I'm ready for questions if there's time. And uh, Olivia or Ruth, do you see anything in the chat or are there any questions or comments? I see Megan has- I have a, Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, John, so where is this project? Is there a one specific area that this project is being done or is this something that you're trying to establish in different, in multiple states or just one particular area? The, step, the steps are find committed project site first, then go for grant funding, and then work out all the details. So we're in the mode right now of finding one or more first sites because we can't go for grant funding without a specific site already committed. So you need to find landowners, in other words. Yeah, I'm we're willing. Using, I'm using land conservancies as contacts also to help find some of these. And there may be some of them in the works, but nothing is solid yet. That answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. Yeah. Great, fantastic project. Thanks. That's very important. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry, could you put your um, contact info in the chat, please, The that you had on your last slide? It's in the slide content. They can probably extract it that way. I can, I'm not going to do it from here now. I'll make sure that goes out. You can forward it okay. one way. Thank you, Paula. Yeah, I'll make sure it goes out. I'm thinking Craybilly. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? There is a question in the chat. Can you give the source for the blight-free chestnut, John? I have two sources. One is a student of mine in Western Pennsylvania who has a little nursery who's growing them. The second one is a name I don't have in front of me now. It's not a source that is public, but it's a name that was given to me at a presentation we did at Audubon Preserve um a month ago somebody's told me his brother has several of these blight free chestnut trees growing in central new jersey somewhere around the great swamp and he has an abundance of seed the contact is still to be developed but that's my other source it's not an open public source i have a question john have have you discussed this with any of the state or county uh, forestry or natural resource people to see if there's any willingness to consider doing this on public land? Um, I spoke with DCNR secretary at the We Conserve conference uh, a few weeks ago. I've dropped a, a primer in her lap and said, 
you're going to be hearing from us on this one. And I've been working with DCNR, our local DCNR representative here in the Delaware Valley. <clears throat> um, going through the forestry is, forestry is oriented totally different than this whole project, which you may be aware of that one. <clears throat> um, and for reasons which could take an, a half an hour to explain. So I'm going through the land conservancies as my primary contacts. Um, they all have connections with government as well, but <clears throat> their connection is critical. And I'm working now with about three of the conservancies, the local ones. Well, I wanna thank you, John, so much. And because you're applying your lifelong career to the highest order responsibility we share, which is to leave the planet intact and in one piece. So I want to express a lot of gratitude for your vision. And I hope those of us who are affiliated with Quaker institutions, schools, retirement communities that have properties will take seriously this as an opportunity to follow up with John and explore what this might look like to do at whatever the minimum scale is, but you know, dream, dream big. And as he said offline before we started, even though the ticket price for this kind of work is, is high by the standards of those of us who are just planting our backyards, but in terms of the benefit and what people invest to either develop or produce other purposes on land, it's a, it's a bargain. So I definitely hope that any of you who are related to family foundations or do any work that would allow you to share ideas about fundraising with John to, to do that as well. So I'm gonna shift now and share my screen again, just to wrap up and I'm gonna turn the, turn things over to Ruth. And um, Ruth is, has an action that we can all take and then I'm gonna just close up with next steps. Thank you, Paula. Thank you both of you for your uh, presentations. There's just so much to absorb there and appreciate. Um, as we address climate change and biodiversity loss, we do have to use all the tools we have. So the two projects we heard about tonight are wonderful examples of hands-on mitigation efforts. Um, and along with supporting projects like these, we do need to advocate for policies and regulations to protect forests. Paula mentioned that a large portion of land in the United States is privately owned. But the government also owns and manages large areas of forests. And the Center for Biological Diversity has a campaign right now urging the US Forest Service to protect and preserve the mature and old growth forests under their care. Um, those forests are the nation's largest west reservoir of carbon, carbon, according to Inside Climate News article from June 4th. The campaign is so critical right now because in anticipation of hotter, drier summers leading to more forest fires like the ones in Canada right now, whose um, impact we're even feeling here, the Forest Service has more than 20 projects um, that plan to log and burn more than 370,000 acres of mature and old growth trees in the national forests. Um, these projects may be based on faulty assessment of climate, assi si assess of climate science, sorry. And um, I mentioned an article in Inside Climate News. They also cite Robert Birdsey, who is a distinguished scientist with the Forest Service for 40 years. He says that middle-aged forests of the Eastern United States would continue to absorb and store carbon over the next two decades, which are crucial decades for staving off the climate crisis. But that will only happen if those forests are allowed to stand. If you wanna help protect these vital old forests, you can find more information at two links that I'm gonna put in the chat while Paul is going over next steps with us. Um, one is a link to the Center for Biological Diversity's campaign and a direct um, link to taking action. And the other is a link to the article that I talked about in Inside Climate News. So I'll put those in the chat now and I hope you'll check them out and consider taking action. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ruth. I'm just gonna quote the United Nations here. Our future depends on preventing the collapse of the natural systems that provide our food, clean water, clean air, and a stable climate. 
In order to preserve these services, we must protect enough of the natural world to sustain them. That word enough is probably accurate, but it's not enough. And all of us need to go beyond just enough. So I hope you'll think about whether or not you have a role to play in either the Doug Tallamy scale or on a larger scale. The next steps for us is that we are asking friends, meeting houses, retirement communities and schools and anyone else in the, in the tri-state area who's interested in participating in hosting a tour. So people who think this is a great idea but not sure what it would look like or wanna to talk to people who've done it, have an opportunity to do that. And our first tour for the greater Philadelphia area is uh, on June 17th in the Southern Chester County. It's going to be held at Barclay Friends and Kendall Crossens, which are two retirement communities. So if anyone knows anyone at a retirement community and they wanna try to influence their retirement community to do more responsible ecological landscaping, this would be a great opportunity, as well as a Friends Meeting House, Birmingham Friends. So they're all fairly near each other. They have a, a sequence of visits, so you can do them all and have lunch in Westchester or enjoy the day in, in our area. So I hope you'll do that. And if you are a part of a meeting house, a school or retirement community, we have a, a kit that you can use to learn how to host a tour, register with us. We'll get it on the uh, Philadelphia Yearly Meeting calendar and we'll they'll have a chance to do that. And then um, finally, I wanted to say thank you for joining us on behalf of the Concord Quarter Climate Action Working Group, the Eco Justice Collaborative, as well as the Chester County Interfaith Action Committee, the Westchester Green Teams Living Landscapes, and the West Town Environmental Advisory Council. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. And I'll just give you a hint that we've had enough interest that probably in the fall we'll do something on uh, greening cemeteries because a lot of Religious organizations run cemeteries, and that's another landscape that we might be able to do something about. So keep your eye out for that as well if you're involved in any way in, in, that, in that role. So thanks again. Thank you to um, Ruth and Olivia for hosting us and um, wishing you all well. Thanks again. Thank you, Paul and John and Olivia.